All right, good afternoon. Um, final session of the last day. It's going to be a bit of... <laughs> I know I'm feeling that way already. I've just been writing it. So, uh, my name's Craig Aspinall. Um, I'm going to talk about graph databases and how we're using it in, uh, in my company. Um, if you didn't get the reference in the title of the talk, it's from the movie Sixth Sense, where Ellie Joel Olsen says, hey, I see dead people everywhere. And I kind of feel like that, or I felt like that for a couple of years. Um, where I keep looking at things and going, you know, this would be really nicely modeled as a graph. And I've been looking for something to do where I could actually try something out for real with a graph database and came across that opportunity uh, a little earlier this year. So I'll uh, talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so I actually gave a talk a couple of years ago at OSDC uh, where I covered seven different databases and the different database paradigms um, at uh, OSDC Sydney. Um, and during that talk, that was based on a book, Seven Databases in Seven Weeks, and they described and I pinched their metaphor of describing graph databases as bungee cords, because you can pretty much wrap them around anything. You know? As long as you've got enough of them and they stretch far enough, you can fit whatever kind of data in that you want, which is kind of interesting. Um, so the opportunity that came up, um, I'm the technical co-founder of a company called Bags Up, which is in the travel space. Um, it's the, uh, tagline says, search less, no more. So what we're trying to do with Bags Up is uh, when you want to go somewhere, you want to have a, a travel experience, rather than going to TripAdvisor and saying, hey, I want to go to New York, and you get 2,000 hotels back in New York, and you're stuck with this paradox of choice. Um, we actually work to get all the context around you and people that you know, and we'll give you recommendations based on people that you know have actually been to hotels in New York. So instead of having 2,000 search results come back, you'll get three or four. Um, and the same for experiences and um, places to eat and things like that. So that's what we're trying to do. And that very much lends itself to a, a graph type of problem. It's in, you know, it's, there's elements of social networking and social graphs in there. So that's why we're exploring uh, graph databases. And Neo4j is the actual one that we're using. I'm going to spend most of the session actually giving a bit of a demo. So um, a little bit of graph database theory. Has anybody played with graph databases before? Do you know what graphs are? <laughs> cool. All right. So um, for those that don't, this is a graph database that describes a graph database. Or it's a graph that describes a graph database. But you could put it into a database, right? So a graph records data in nodes and relationships. So we've got the two relationships here. So these are nodes. These are relationships. They're simple, right? Labels group nodes together, so you can say, hey, I'm going to label these particular nodes as users and these nodes as uh, likes or messages or whatever else, and then you can um, group them in that way so you have some sort of um, categorization over what your objects or nodes are. Uh, relationships organize nodes, and both relationships and nodes can have properties. So you can add extra data to relationships and nodes, or at least you can with Neo, which is where these diagrams are put, uh, stolen from. So a node can have relationships uh, and it can have properties. It's again, relationships can have properties and nodes can have labels. Labels, as you said, are the ways of grouping them. A relationship has a start node and an end node, so it connects just two nodes together. And it, it's a directed relationship, so it goes from one node to another one. So they always have a direction, again, at least in Neo. Um, Relationships have a type which is described by a name or identified by a name. So you can say this is a likes relationship or this is a friend relationship, for example. And it said relationships can have properties. So you can say this person liked this thing on this particular date. Or we know that they liked it because we saw it in Facebook. So you can add extra metadata to a relationship to identify something about that particular relationship. Um, I like them because you can do things like this. They're very whiteboard friendly. So you can draw something out and start putting little note objects in there and putting links between them and figuring out what those links are. And if you can model data like this, and I do this all the time, this is what I say about this is the way my mind works, um, then this lends itself really well to being um, actually put into a graph database. So this is kind, this is sort of a little bit of a work in progress for the demo that I'm going to give you. So on here we've got a bunch of people. So I've got myself. Carl, Ben, and Penny. Um, I'm a friend of Carl, uh, Carl's. Carl is friends with Penny and Ben, and Penny and Ben are friends directly as well. So we've got me out on a little spur over here and this little triumvirate of friends on the right. Carl and Ben have visited Seattle before, so they've got something else in common. Ben and I both like coding, we're both coders. 
Carl and Penny both like food. And then we've got some different, rela different relationships and no types over here. So I've got that I've visited Paris and I've visited the Crown at Bray. Does anybody know the Crown? Anybody been to the UK? Any foodies? So the Crown is Heston Blumenthal's tub, uh, pub, I should say, gastro pub. So you presumably know who Heston Blumenthal is. So he has the Fat Duck, which is the ridiculously expensive restaurant, and the Crown, which is the ridiculously expensive pub. So, but the pub is good. I never went to the Fat Duck. So, that's pretty much it. I'm going to jump straight in and actually show you some stuff. And all being well, this works. Right. So this is Neo4j's uh, web interface. So this is just a Firefox browser. I've just removed everything so we can get more stuff on the screen. And it's got a really nice interface for playing around with things. It's got some really nice visualizations in which I will show you as well. Um, Neo4j itself is an open, well, it's a dual license uh, offering. So there's an open source community version. There's a paid licensed version with support. And if you want to do really big stuff, you've got to pay the license fee, which is a little bit annoying. But um, these guys do an awful lot of work in the community for doing uh, education around graph databases. And there's a lot of online uh, material that they produce, there are free O'Reilly books that they produce, and the information they give you is not specific to just Neo. So they do tell you about the graph stuff in general. So the nice thing about this is once you load it up, um, there's actually a whole bunch of stuff they give you in here as well. So there's little videos and exercises you can go through. Um, and one of the nice things about this is that it, you can store um, queries in there, so you can rerun them, and so that's basically what I'm going to do as we go through. So. The, um, if we have a look down the left-hand side here, these are some of the queries that I've done. So this first one, if I just run that, basically goes and grabs everything that's in the database, and at the moment there's nothing in it because I deleted it before the demo started. It's a good, probably a good idea. So we're getting nothing back. My database with nothing in it is not really very interesting. So if I click on this one, we can have a bit of a closer look at this. So. Uh, Neo has its own query language called Cypher, which is kind of, kind of like SQL for graph databases, or for Neo at least. Um, you can use other graph query languages with it as well, um, but Cypher is the one that they use, and it's fairly easy to get into, and it's fairly self-explanatory as to what it's doing. So what we've got here is um, a create statement. And it's creating a bunch of nodes and relationships. It's actually creating a little friend network of four people that I had up on the whiteboard image before. So the first thing here between these parentheses is a node. So the name Craig at the very beginning, this first one, actually has no impact on the database. It's just creating a binding that we can use elsewhere in this statement. So it's creating like a local variable, if you like, that we can then use elsewhere in the statement when we want to create relationships to that particular node. So we've got a reference back to it. The colon user is the label for that particular node. So we're creating a user type, essentially, or a user label. So saying, hey, I'm a user of whatever this is. And then this bit here are the actual properties for that node. So I'm giving myself a name with my name in it, not surprisingly, right? So we're going to create a node. That node's going to have a label of user and a property called name with the value Craig. And we just rinse and repeat. So we've got another node for Carl, another node for Penny, another node for Ben. Easy peasy. All with me so far? All good. Awesome. Right. So the next bit are the relationships. And they kind of do like an ASCII art type thing here. So they actually try and draw them out. So this. Craig is reusing the Craig node that we created on the first line. Right, so that's where the name matches up, that's where the binding happens. So saying, look, take the node called Craig, create a relationship with the label nose, so a nose relationship between that node and the node called Carl, or the node that we bound to Carl. So it looks, you can see there's an arrow essentially drawn with the label in the middle of it. That's what it's supposed to represent. So now we've got a relationship from me to Carl with the label nodes. And if we wanted to add attributes to that, we can add them in the same way that we did with the nodes themselves. We can just put squiggly brackets and name value pairs in there, or key value pairs. So again, rinse, repeat. So we create another relationship between Carl and Ben, another relationship between Carl and Penny, and a relationship between, Carl, uh, between Penny and Ben. 
and we finish this off with a return statement. And the return style just says, give me back everything that you touched. So any node, any relationship, anything that was created or touched as part of this query, just give it back to me. Okay. All happy? Cool. Awesome. Ah, go away. So I'm just going to run this up here. And it gives us back a nice pretty graph. Look at that. How good is that? So can you make out what that says? Do I need to increase the size a little bit, maybe? So we can actually see the graph that it's created. And this is one of the really cool things about playing around with this. And I'll just drag this out a little bit so we can see the names and the relationships. So you can basically reposition nodes and they kind of work. Let's come back to that in a second. I saw, so it's the opposite way around. So I had it on the whiteboard, but there I am, and I know Carl. Carl knows Ben and Penny. Penny knows Ben, right? So that friendship network that we had on the whiteboard is now in there with just that one statement, nice and easy. Um, I said there are some cool visualization stuff. The reason that we can see these names, hello. Um, if we click on an individual node, you can see the properties assigned to it in here. So you get like a little uh, inspector uh, floating window that comes up, but you can actually change the visualizations as well. So you can increase the size of nodes or decrease the size of them. You can change the colors of them and things like that. And you can obviously make your own custom style sheet things if you want to. So that back to how it was. But the other interesting thing is up here, you can choose which of the properties you want to use as the caption. So these are always created with a node ID, but that's not really very useful given that I don't know who 61, 62, and 63 are. So I'd already switched this around when I've been doing it previously to use the name, so that's a bit more meaningful information. But it does mean if you get a graph and you want to see other properties, so you can kind of go, oh, well, these people are all Facebook friends, for example, you can do the same thing with that. So that's all right. That's kind of cool. Let's bring this back in. So that's all well and good. Let's have a look at this one. So this is another query, uh, another create query. Now this one's creating no users, no friend rel or nose relationships. This is creating a hierarchy of places. So we've got a different um, node type. Let me close this out so we get a bit more space. So we've got a different label on these nodes. We've put a place label on them instead. We're still giving them a name attribute, but these are the names of the actual places as opposed to the names of the users. And again, we've got four. So we've got Maidenhead, Berkshire, and it is Berkshire, not Berkshire, uh, England, United Kingdom. Okay? So not surprisingly, if you know anything about that part of the world, Maidenhead is in Berkshire, Berkshire is in England, England is in the United Kingdom, United Kingdom nominally is in Europe, although we'll see how long that lasts. <laughs> um, uh, and then that's in the world, and the world's in the solar system, the solar system's in the galaxy, and the galaxy's in the universe. So you know, we're kind of building out so we can extend to, you know, uh, space travel if we need to. We can just keep adding things on. So we've got four nodes that we've created and we've got three relationships. So exactly how I described it to you is exactly how it's described in the Cypher query. So Maidenhead is in Berkshire, Berkshire is in England, England is in the UK. Okay. And again, return star. If we run this, we get back four nodes. I'll drag these out so we can actually see. And again, it's kind of put them the opposite way around to how I might think about it, but Maidenhead is in Berkshire, Berkshire is in England, England is in the United Kingdom. Easy. So this graph, or this graph fragment, is completely detached from the other graph fragment, but they both exist at the same time, and we can see that if we just go and ask it to give us all the information back again. So there we've got both graph fragments, both in, being returned from the same query, but they're clearly not connected. And that's perfectly OK. You might want completely disconnected pieces of your graph. Pieces of data might not be connected in any way. That's all right. That's the actual case. Um, doesn't necessarily make for a very interesting demo, though, if we just keep creating places of uh, pieces of non-connected data. So here's a slightly different type of query. This is like an update query. So Given that's what we've got down at the bottom, now what I can do is I can go and find data in that graph and I can start creating new data and adding new relationships to it. So I can augment what's already there without disturbing anything that's already in place. So I don't need to change any of the existing nodes to be able to add information and enrich the data that we've got. 
So in this particular case, I'm matching Maidenhead, so the place that I just added, I'm saying go find me a place with the name Maidenhead and bind it to the Maidenhead variable. Go find me a user with the name Craig and bind that to the Craig variable. And then we go and create the crown at Bray, the pub that I was talking about, the gastro pub. Right? So we're going to create that as a venue. So we've now got a third type of node. So we've got places, venues, and users. Now we're reusing on this line the in relationship, but this time we're putting a venue in a place. That's a perfectly legitimate thing to do, right? It makes sense. Places, venues have a location, and if we're using in to represent that one location is a superset of another location, it doesn't matter whether it's a place or a venue, we can still use that, it makes perfect sense. We've also added two other types of relationship. So we've added that I like the crown, so the, the crown at Bray. If you ever do go there, the bangers and mash with onion gravy are awesome. Probably set you back about $30, but it's still good. It's $30 eight years ago. Um, and I also that I lived in Maidenhead. Okay? So we've created these new nodes and we've created new relationships between old nodes and the new ones. So if we run this, all being well, and go and query back all of our data again. Now we might really need to start pulling this out. So let's pull Penny and Ben over here to create some space. Pull this down. Whoops, down there. Pull that over here. Pull those down there. So we can just jiggle these until we get to a point that we're kind of reasonably happy with them. So now there is connections between the old graph fragment and the new graph fragment. So we've got myself and the old graph fragment up here. Maintain the new graph fragment. I've now put down that I like the crown at Bray and that that place, that venue was in Maidenhead. And we've also added the fact that I lived in Maidenhead. So from a bags up point of view, when we're trying to understand context of people, we actually know quite a lot now about, the, about myself, Maidenhead and the crown. We know that I lived there. So there's an inference that we could make, particularly if we put time, if we put time stamps on these. We can say, hey, this is a local, and this is where a local goes to eat. It's not just where visitors go to eat, for example, which might be useful. Um, we can enrich the graph even further with more information about what people like. So if they're foodies, for example. And we can create links between venues and, and those tags as well as people. So we can start to build up a rich set of information that allows us to give more context back when you're doing a search or provide more contextual answers when people are doing a search. So that's all good, that's nice and clear. Still no information anywhere else. So let's add, which one have we got now? Uh, this one. So we just have essentially one place made and had and one venue in that place. So let's mix it up a bit more and we'll put another place in and another venue in. So this time we created Windsor Castle, which is not surprisingly in Windsor, right? Exactly the same syntax as we had before. We figure out this time we match on the Berkshire place, because Windsor's also in Berkshire, but it's not in Maidenhead. Uh, they are neighboring uh, suburbs, essentially. Um, again, find me as the user in the graph, create the, the Windsor Castle node, create Windsor as a place, put Windsor into Berkshire and put the castle in Windsor. And put down that I visited Windsor Castle. Again, that could have a timestamp on it, so we can say, hey, I visited it in 2001, probably, something like that. So this time we're not returning anything. There's no return statement on the end of here. So when we run this, we're not going to get anything back other than a statement that says, hey, you could have made these changes to the database. We're not actually going to get the graph nodes back and the relationships back. So we don't see the visualization. But we can go and run the same query we've been running before. Oops, run that. And we can see that it's added those in. So I'll just drag this out a bit. We can see now that we've got the Windsor Castle and Windsor in there, but now there's a nice loop around here. So we keep adding information into the graph and we can add different types of information. We've added venues and places and likes and visited and lived in relationships. So we're enriching the graph all the time. And as we discover new things, we can keep adding it to the database. So, that's all well and good. But what we really want to do is 
make this, so if we're going to query this, it's pretty straightforward already, right? There's only really one place where anybody's been, and that's in Berkshire, or two places have been in Berkshire. So let's actually go and muddy this up a bit and put a whole bunch of extra data in there. So I'm going to run that, and then we'll take a look at our graph. Full screen this out. So all this data is centered around me because obviously I am the center of the universe. That's all that matters. No, not really. My kids think they're the center of the universe. That's true. Um, so let me drag this one down here. Drag one down there. Okay. So we've got my friend network down at the bottom, and now we've got three different countries that I have been in for one reason or another. We've got that I visited the Louvre, which is in Paris, which is obviously in France. I lived on the Gold Coast in Queensland, Australia. And then we've got the original information up in the right, top right-hand corner. So what happens if um, Penny wants to visit England? Right? OK, compared to Australia, England's not a very big place. Right? But there's still a lot to do there. There's a lot packed into that not very much space. So she's thinking, oh, what can I do? If I'm interested in going to England, what are the things that I really should do? So she can go and search, and if we put together a query, we can help her. We can say, well, okay, you're connected to these people in other ways. The chances are you have something in common with them. And obviously, the more information we put into the graph, the more we can determine how much commonality there is between people that are in your network. Um, so why don't we just go and search for people who are in your network who have been to England and see what they did? Okay, so that's the query that we're going to run here. So I'm going to just pull this out. So this is a slightly different form of the match query. So we've got a P equals at the beginning here, and then we've got this sort of funny looking statement there. Basically what we're doing is we're looking for paths. We're actually looking for paths through the network or through the graph. So the P equals says, go and match all the paths that match this particular pattern. What we're saying is we want a user who we're going to bind to Penny who is within two steps of some other user. We're just going to call person for now. So they could be one or two steps away because if you don't want people who are six <coughs> steps away, you don't know them, right? That's Kevin Bacon has been to England. Probably don't have a lot in common with Penny. With, uh, Penny probably doesn't have a lot in common with Kevin Bacon. But given that we have a mutual friend, she probably knows me anyway, right? She probably does know me first time. We're just not connected in the graph. And she certainly would know to ask Carl to ask me if she wanted more information about something. So we keep limited to two steps. To say, OK, Penny, we want two steps, one or two steps away. We want to link her to venues which are in England, OK? Now remember, these names before the colons are just bindings. They're not actually doing anything. So where the real magic happens is in this where clause. So we're basically saying, we want this pattern, but we're going to lock the two ends of it. So at one end, we're going to lock the user to Penny, which is the second part. We're saying, right, Penny's name needs to be Penny, and that's the unique identifier for Penny, which would normally be a, a user ID or an email address or whatever. But for our super simple graph, the name will do. So we're locking it there. The other place we're locking it is in the um, country, so the place England. So saying we want the England's name to be England. So we, now we've got only two points, and we're going to work out what all of the different paths are between those two points and return them all. So if we run that, does that make sense? So you kind of see how that relationship works. So there's slightly this funny one here. This double dash just means we don't care what the type of relationship is. So it do, we don't bother whether it's a likes relationship, a visited relationship, a lived-in relationship, whatever it is. But just give us any relationships that anybody in my network has with anywhere that's in England. So it's still fairly general. And then return all those paths. And if we do that, we pull England out to one side and Penny out to the other. Then we get all this interesting information back. So as you'd expect, we get the two venues back that are the only two venues that are actually in there, apart from the Louvre, the only two venues in England, the Crown and Windsor Castle. Right? And that's kind of what we'd expect if we were going to do a simple SQL query. Right? But we actually get back a whole bunch of other information in the path. So Penny knows that I was the person that was here. 
She knows that she's connected to me through Carl. She knows that I visited Windsor Castle and that I liked the crown. She also can tell that I lived in the same town as where the crown is. So there might be other information she can go and get from me. And obviously, these two being in close proximity, there's more information we could add in there, which means that she could say, oh, well, whilst you were living there, you also went to visit Windsor Castle and you know, maybe Legoland and other places that are in that area. So it's not just that we're getting the answer back, we're actually getting a lot of context back, which adds to the value of the information. It means that the person who's taking the query can go, that's actually super relevant. And if the information that they want is not there, they can actually, they know how to get to it because she can ask Carl to ask me or if she knows me directly, she can come and ask. So that's, the, that's what we're kind of looking at using the graph database stuff for. And we're using polyglot databases. It's not just the graph stuff that we use. So there's traditional SQL and key value store stuff in there as well. Um, not much um, columnar stuff or, or um, uh, document-based stuff, but we are using the, those other three. So um, that's pretty much it. More or less out of time. Have anybody got, anybody got any questions? I'll leave this open in case I need it to answer anything. One trouble causes. There's always one. Do you want to make any comments about the performance of the kind of the, any comments about the performance of the kind of query you just were just making and how it might uh, perform in a uh, relational style database? So it depends on the scale of your data. So in a small toy database like this, doesn't really make a whole bunch of difference. But if you were to model this in a relational database, you would end up with these relationships causing self-joins. So you're basically multiplying out this, your search domain exponentially each time you join back onto yourself. So if you do a three, um, three degrees removed search, you're then doing four, no, three joins onto itself. And the way that SQL works, it basically goes and gets the whole, typically works, depends on the optimization involved, but it will go and get the whole result set and then filter through it. The way that the graph database works, it never actually goes outside of the things that it's immediately connected to. So because we lock it at these two places, it's naturally, it's effectively done all of the filtering beforehand and then just, or most of the filtering beforehand and then just picks out the routes that actually make sense and match the pattern. So on large databases, this is orders of magnitude faster for this type of, of query than a, a SQL database typically is. Um, but you can get graph database, you can overlay graph databases onto SQL databases and other kind of store as well. So it's not, the way that Neo works, it uses native storage, which makes it very, very fast to do that. We can have more questions with the team. Yep, no problem. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.